Well, welcome one more time to Mill City Church. Everybody, we're so glad to have you here. Please find your chair. If you're here at Sheridan, we will continue worshiping together. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Happy birthday, Stacy May. Happy birthday, happy birthday. 39 and holding. That's right. Welcome to Paul's Sunday, everybody. We're so glad to have you here. Would you say a prayer with me as we look at the scripture this morning? Jesus, we thank you so much that whenever we're gathered together, you promise to be with us. So we just acknowledge your presence as our, our Savior and our Lord and our teacher and our guide. And we pray that you open our hearts and our minds just to learn from this story of how you entered Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday and um, took up the mantle of king in a new way. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you want us to see and hear today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I have a suggested question for you on Easter week. Simple one. It's just, what is Jesus like? What is Jesus like? How would you describe Jesus? Maybe somebody will ask you this week. What is, what's Jesus like? What kinds of descriptions come to your mind when you hear that question? Whether you're a Christian or not, just what kind of descriptions come into your head when you think about Jesus? When you describe your other friends, think of some other friend you have. You might say, oh, this friend is kind or funny or generous or stubborn or ambitious or talkative or introverted or whatever, right? You're just describing the people that are important to you in your life. I encourage you just to think about Jesus in the same way this week. How would you describe Jesus, especially the people who maybe don't know anything about Jesus? I came up with a few different descriptions, things like Jesus is compassionate. Jesus is self-sacrificing. Jesus is protective. Jesus is somebody who defies my expectations all the time. He seems to always be doing things in a way that I don't expect him to. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the King of Kings. Like the list could go on and on and on, right? So for you, just this week, wrestle with that question a little bit. Today is Palm Sunday when we remember and celebrate Jesus entering Jerusalem as the Messiah King less than a week before he's killed on the cross and comes back to life. But when Jesus is entering, the, entering Jerusalem, people find out pretty quickly he's not the kind of king that they expect when they're celebrating him. So we're going to talk a little bit about how Jesus is different. At Mill City, sometimes we say Jesus is a different kind of king with a different kind of kingdom. And today we want to remember what kind of king Jesus really is. So we're going to read this story about how Jesus enters Jerusalem, but we've got to do a little bit of backstory before we do that. And you have to go all the way back to a text in 1 Samuel chapter 8. So maybe later you have time to read 1 Samuel chapter 8. Hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth, there was a bad breakup between the people of God and God as their king. And it's foreshadowing to this moment where Jesus becomes king. And in that story in 1 Samuel 8, the Israelites ask Samuel, who had been their prophet and their leader and the person who helped them listen to God, they ask him to give them a human king so they can be like the other nations who also have a human king. Samuel's very distraught about this and is praying about it, talking to God and saying, they've asked me for a human king, like, what do I say? And God said, go back to them and warn them because they're rejecting me as king. They're not rejecting you. Warn them of what a human king is going to be like. Warn them that a human king is going to demand things of them, is going to take their best resources, is going to ask them to pay taxes, is going to take their sons and daughters to serve their kingdom, and is going to use their resources to build up themselves and their family and their future. That's often what human kings do. Look around. That's what other, other human kings are doing. And the Israelites come back to Samuel and say, we hear you, we get that, we don't care. We really want to have a human king that we can see and follow, and he can ride out in front of us into our battles and help us fight our battles. And so that's how the Israelites got their first human king, uh, King Saul. And so, fast forward hundreds of years later, we have this story of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And the reason he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey is because of this prophecy in Zechariah 9 where it says the Messiah king, God's king, the son of David, will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And so as we read this story, you'll hear Jesus very intentionally seek out a donkey 
and ride in so that he can proclaim himself as king. Here it is in Matthew chapter 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches, palm branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds then went out ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. And when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying, they asked him? Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read? From the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise. And then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany, where he spent the night. So Jesus, on Palm Sunday, intentionally gets this donkey that he can ride in, and it's the reintroduction from hundreds of years ago of God as Israel's king. No longer will there be any other king in Israel. God, now in human form in Jesus, is going to be their king again like God was a long time ago. And God will not allow anything to prevent us from experiencing God's presence and God's love and God's mercy directly. There's no more intermediary. So Jesus enters the city as a different kind of king. He's not going to overthrow Rome and then, you know, reclaim political power. He's not going to put his followers in positions of power, even though they repeatedly asked him to do that. He's not going to make people pay him to rule over them. And he's not going to elevate the current religious leaders so that they have more power over other people. He's not going to do any of those things. All of those groups wished that he would do those things, right? So what is he going to do? Jesus is going to do what the people needed him to do, not necessarily what they wanted him to do or what they thought they wanted him to do. He's going to be the kind of king that they need him to be, not necessarily the kind of king that they expected him to be or the one that they were even asking for. The first thing that Jesus does when he enters the city of Jerusalem in in Matthew's story is to go to the temple and drive out all of these money changers and dove salesmen, for, for lack of a better term. The first thing that he does is go in and physically remove people from the temple. Lots of people, not just one guy. A whole strip mall full of terrible money changers and dove salespeople. When Jesus enters the temple, he's angry. He's mad. He's upset. Now, is angry one of the words you would use to describe Jesus? If someone asked you this week, would you say what Jesus is like? You say, he's angry, real angry. No, you wouldn't say that, right? We we lead with all sorts of other ways of describing Jesus, which is appropriate. But every so often, we get a picture in Scripture of what makes Jesus mad. 
What makes Jesus angry? And I would say the thing that's making Jesus angry here is that anything that distracts or prevents people from entering into God's presence angers Jesus. Anything that prevents people or distracts them from access to God's immediate love and grace and mercy and challenge in their life makes Jesus mad. And he drives it out. So we have this picture of money changers and doves. And in case you don't know what that means, let me give you the 30-second snapshot of it. You have a system for selling sacrificial animals because part of what people came to do when they came to worship in the temple was to offer a sacrifice for their sins or for some other reason that Scripture calls for, and they wouldn't have maybe brought the animals with them. And they might even be from out of town, so they don't have the right money. So they first have to go to the international exchange desk and change their money for the right kind of local money. And then they take the local money and they buy a dove so that they have something to offer for the sacrifice. And Jesus is upset with these folks because A, they're making money on the, on the financial exchange of changing the money. And B, because they're selling things at a price that's maybe higher than it needs to be. And they're there to make money in the temple, and that's not what the temple's about. And then secondly, he's upset because some of the people who are coming to the temple don't really have a heart for worshiping God. They're just trying to, like, keep this God happy. So I'll buy the thing I need to buy, and I'll go through the motions, and I'll do the things I'm supposed to do, the rituals I'm supposed to do, and hopefully that'll bring some kind of blessing in my life. But they're not actually interested in a personal connection with the God of the universe. And so Jesus, as he's driving these people out, says to them two things that are important. One, he says, my house will be called a house of prayer. And you have to know that as a rabbi, Jesus sometimes will use just a few words, like my, my house will be called a house of prayer, to refer to a whole section of scripture. In this case, Isaiah chapter 56. You should go back and read that too. I, Isaiah chapter 56, which describes how God's temple is supposed to be a house of prayer. And in that chapter, there's two important pieces. One is that the, the temple is supposed to be a place where people outside of Israel can access the God of the Israelites, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because one of the essential identities of Israel is to be people who live their lives in the world such that other people wonder about the God that they serve. And the temple is supposed to be the place where those persons can come and actually engage with God and learn more about God and worship God. But they had made the temple such that those people had no access to the temple. And so they were failing on that account. The second thing in Isaiah 56 is that it mentions the place of eunuchs, people who are not able to physically reproduce or have a family, which in the ancient world is uh, the same thing as being cursed. And it says in the same chapter that God intends for there to be a place in the temple for such persons to be included in the family of God and given a space, an honored space to worship God, if they're seeking that God. And so Jesus uses this phrase to say, the temple is not just for you. It's for all these people who might be wanting to know who I am. And when you prevent them from coming in here, you do damage to my reputation. And then the second thing he says here is that he's, you've not only not made it a house of prayer, but you've instead made it a den of robbers. Den of robbers comes from uh, Jeremiah chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7 is a really harsh critique of what's happening at that time. Where um, we're, we're learning that the people of that time were coming to worship and engaging in worship rituals in the temple, but then they were just going out and living their lives however they wanted to. And so Jeremiah is saying, how in the world do you think you can just go out into your everyday life and do whatever you want in terms of injustice or immorality, whatever you feel like doing, whatever fulfills you, and then come to the temple and act like you can worship God as if everything was good? It isn't good. Your relationship with God is broken. And when you come here and pretend like your life outside of the temple doesn't affect your life inside the temple, you create a den of robbers in the temple. Now, I draw a direct connection here to the way that the world sees lots of churches, not necessarily this church, but lots of churches, and our issue with hypocrisy, right? One of the number one descriptions for people outside the church is that these are hypocritical people. 
they demand, and they should demand, and the, and the Bible demands that our life in here, when we're together, and our life outside of here has some integrity to it, right? The people expect that if you're a follower of Jesus and you go to church, that somehow that impacts the rest of your life. And if they look at the way you work and the way you treat your neighbors and the way you spend your money and the way you engage in relationships, that there's something about Jesus that comes through in those things. Amen? So Jesus is upset because the temple is supposed to be a place where people who want to worship God, learn about God, experience God's presence can enter in and they can't. And the people at the time of Jesus had created all these barriers to that happening, and they had made it about business and making money and excluding people and welcoming other people to the extent that it became a show and was not the actual reality of hearts of people who wanted to love and worship God. And that's what made Jesus mad. And so he drove them out. He physically removed them from the space. Now, let's just think about this from a 21st century perspective. It's super easy to be judgy about what people did wrong a long time ago, right? Oh, my gosh. These people had no clue. I can't believe what they were doing. Why would they ever do anything like that? How could they think that profiting off of selling sacrifices was a good idea? How could they exclude people who were seeking God? No wonder Jesus got mad at those people. But it's important for us to be self-reflective. And to think, are there any ways in which God may challenge us with this story to think of ourselves as the money changers or the dove sellers or the religious leaders who are excluding people? I know for me, there are a lot of things that get in between me and God, to put it real simply. There are a lot of things in my life that prevent me from authentically connecting with Jesus if I let them. I know that if I don't keep Jesus as the top priority in my life, there are a whole bunch of other things that are ready to fill that space. I don't know if that's your experience. I made a list of some of them that sometimes seep into my life and the life of, of all of us, right? The number one thing that comes onto my list is just real simple. It's busyness. It is a countercultural act right now in the 21st century to carve out attention and space in your daily life to focus on God. And if you don't do that in some way, in a practice that works for you by listening to Scripture or praying or talking to your friends or engaging in your neighborhood or acting in some justice way, like if you don't do that intentionally, it won't happen. Your phone will eat your life. Other things will distract you. Other things that are trying to get your attention will take your attention. And so we have to live in such a way that continues to focus our attention on God. In the scripture here, we get all these hints of, of Jesus and others being upset about the way people are worshiping other gods. Worshiping other gods is a weird phrase, I think, sometimes in the 21st century. Maybe we don't connect with it as easily as they did because there was such a pantheon of gods and other temples and worship spaces, etc. But I, I just started to name a god, lower G god, as anything that takes the top priority in your life. It could be a relationship could be a job, could be financial security, could be a hoped-for future, you know, um, gods in the form of money or sex or power or privilege or pleasure, any of those things. Anything that takes your priority so that your time and your energy and your attention are naturally going to that first and everything else is coming second, it has become a god in your life. I also listed hurt as something that can become, come between us and Jesus, connecting authentically with Jesus. Many of us have been prevented from connecting with Jesus by others who have hurt us. And for some of us, that's happened in the church. And so we have to acknowledge that church hurt and abuse and traumatic experiences and being dismissed or told we don't belong by other people, the list goes on and on and on. But those things can prevent us from connecting with Jesus unless we can experience some kind of healing through conversations and prayer and therapy and all kinds of different forms of healing. And finally, I'll put down injustice as one of those things that comes between us and God that maybe Jesus needs to flip a table or two about. That people, especially those outside the church, look at the injustices of the world and wonder, how could God allow these things to happen? Or why doesn't the church address these things in some way, shape, or form? There's a lot of that injustice in the world, and we need 
to know how it is that God wants us to address it and we need to step into it in order for us to authentically follow Jesus in the 21st century. So maybe a question is, you know, what tables does Jesus need to flip in your life? Maybe there's things in your life that you know, just anything that's between you and your connection with God. Or something that you've known gets in the way easily. Is there a way you need to ask Jesus to remove that thing today? Or is there a way that we as a community, as a church community, as a neighborhood, as a country, need to ask Jesus to remove things that are preventing us from connecting with God? Let me say real clearly here that the grace of God, the mercy of Jesus, always, always, always gives us another chance to recenter our life when we've gotten off course. Recalibrating is part of why we're even here today. I know at least for me, I show up on Sunday, it reorients my life like, oh yeah, I'm in this story. I'm not in all this other nonsense. Like this is what my life's about. I need that all the time. It's one of the reasons why we should worship all the time. There's the grace of God. So don't hear anybody saying to you like, you're wrong and there's nothing you can do about it. No, this is an invitation to be honest about the things that come between us and God and then to accept the grace and mercy of Jesus who says, I will physically remove that stuff so that you can be with me because that's what I want for you. I want to be with you and I have done everything necessary to remove the barriers so we can be together. So all of us can be together. Everything that Jesus did on Easter week, I'm convinced, was to make it possible for the world that God loves, the people that God created, to be with God now and forever. So what needs to be our response to Jesus flipping these tables in this story today? Is there a commitment that you need to make that maybe you'll feel in your gut this morning as you're listening to me speak that you need as a, somebody who's been a Christian a long time perhaps to say, I know this thing is wedged in between me and God and I've got to do something about it. And the something about it is just to say, God, I admit that I need your help. Maybe I'm powerless to remove it. I need to involve other people in that. But I need this to not be there. And I need to listen to scripture and I need to pray and I need to talk about what God's doing in my life so that I can be free and released from whatever it is that's holding me back. And maybe if you're somebody, we know there's a lot of people at Mill City who come to Mill City or watch Mill City online and they're kind of checking out church. They might be checking out Christianity. If you're in that spot, let me say real clearly that I think what Jesus is offering here on this Palm Sunday is an invitation to say, there's a whole bunch of ways to live your life. I'm trying to help you learn how to live a particular way. One that starts with God's grace and love and forgiveness from whatever you came from and whatever you've been involved in, but to hear that God loves you just the way you are. And from there, to go on an adventure of being transformed into a person who knows how to join the work that God's doing as you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit in your life. It's an all-in kind of invitation. If this is what you want your life to be about, you can say yes to that. You might even choose to be baptized on May 1st as a public declaration of your decision to become a Jesus follower and a Christian. The grace of Jesus invites us to recalibrate and reconnect with Jesus, even if we've had to do that a thousand times, which some of us have. After Jesus flips the tables and drives people out, let me invite the band to come up. Matthew tells us that Jesus heals the blind and the lame that came to him at the temple. So picture this, right? Jesus just physically removes all these people. And then there's still some people around, people who are struggling with their sight and struggling to be able to, to move. And Jesus heals them. He goes from riding a donkey instead of a war horse into town as a humble king to removing the distractions and obstacles in people's way to worshiping God to then bringing healing to the people who need it the most. That's a king I want to follow. That's a king with a heart for the people who need God's love and mercy and forgiveness the most, who other people have rejected and not even seen. So if you're someone who needs healing in your life, I just want to say this morning, Jesus is offering you that healing. You don't have to do it on your own. It's, 
It's part of what Jesus did this week. Offer us healing and forgiveness and mercy. Jesus can drive out anything that stands in between you and an authentic connection with God. You can enter God's presence and experience the love and forgiveness and healing that God has for you. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So let me finish by just asking again, what is Jesus like? Well, he's a humble king, right? He's also a strong protector. He's somebody who's really clear about what he's called to do. He's a gentle healer. He's the king we need, even if he's not always the king we think we want. Let's pray. Jesus, we acknowledge you as our king. It's hard to imagine all that you went through this week, all the suffering and the pain that you endured as the king of kings to redefine what it means to lead, to help us understand who God is, and to help us understand the gift that you're offering to us. Help us to be open to let you remove anything that's in our way between you and us. Whether that's a a sin or a hurt, God, an experience in the past, something you've heard other people say or an impression that we've had of what you're like. Help us to see you. Help us to be able to follow you. And And God, for those of us who've been following you a long time, continue to make us more like you in our everyday lives so that people see you, not just on Sunday, but in the love and mercy and generosity of your people. Make your name great this week. In your name we pray. Amen.